If I said to you, you fools, all the disciples were all killed, doesn't that show you that they were following the wrong religion? I think you would be flabbergasted if I said that to you. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Guadalupe, and I'm from uh, California, Los Angeles, California. And I just have a question uh, to ask Rabbi Tubio about why did the Jewish people suffer the way they, they did? And, and if, why did God allow that to happen? Is there anything in the Tanakh that explains that? I just have this uh it's still in, in my heart that I just, I just, I, I just can't explain it. I, I just need, need to uh, have Rabbi Tubia to answer my question. Thank you so much. If you ask a, a secular scholar of history, why was uh, the first temple destroyed? Well, he would say because of the Babylonians, because of Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadnezzar. If you ask a secular thinker, why was the second temple destroyed? He would no doubt tell you because of Rome, it was Vespasian, who was emperor, Titus, who was the general. That's why the, that's why the second temple was destroyed. If you asked a religious Jew, we would tell you because of our sins, we were exiled from the land. In fact, it's a, one of the most moving prayers that we express in the Musaf service, in the prayer service on the holidays. Because of our sins, Golinu Me'artsenu, we were exiled from our land. We're very aware that the children of Israel endure tremendous vicissitudes for many reasons. You know, when people do things, so very often we have to weigh, uh, do a cost-benefit analysis. What's the gain? What's the downside? And we try to make the best decisions where the upside. But when HaKosh Baruch, when the Almighty, blessed be his name, does something, it benefits everyone in some way. The prophet Ezekiel, so Ezekiel lived during the time of the destruction of the first temple. He, he was a contemporary of Jeremiah, although he lived in different areas. His prophetic career began in the land of Israel, but he was exiled to Bovel, to Babylon. And his work, his 48-volume work named after him, is divided into three segments, the three very specific parts. It's, uh, it's a holy book. One of those segments is completely devoted to explaining why the first temple was destroyed. What was going on? You know, the first temple was built by Solomon, King Solomon, the prophet Solomon. Solomon, Shlema HaMelech. And Yechezkel, after having the most ecstatic dream, vision in all of Tanakh, he is told that he is going to see what is destined to happen to the nation. And in fact, a hand that comes out of heaven with a scroll on it. This is one of his visions. He sees a scroll, and on both sides of the scroll are inscribed the lamentations of what would befall the Jewish people. This is an extraordinary vision that comes into view in chapter 2 and chapter 3. The chapter break between 2 and 3 is one of the oddest breaks. It shouldn't be there at all. So he sees, and he takes the scroll, and he's told to eat it. Now, the scroll has on it all the vicissitudes of the Jewish people. And when he eats it, when he puts it in his mouth and swallows it, it tastes like honey. It's sweet, like honey. 
In fact, to our eyes, the pain and suffering that we endure is very great, no doubt. But it's really there for a healing process for everyone. It's there to raise us up. You see very frequently that the children of extremely wealthy people are very unhappy people, and they get themselves into tremendous trouble. They never, anything they want, they have a chauffeur, they have 15 nannies, have, but it's actually, it's not good for them. It's bad for them because they never, there's no challenges. So the children of Israel are very aware of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. We're told very clearly of what would happen to us and notice in these two outstanding chapters, the blessings and the curses, there's no talk, discussion of consequence of sin in the afterlife. None. Nothing. Why? You can't test it. The moment someone starts threatening you with what's going to happen after you die, it's time to walk away, to run away, because you can't check it, you can't test it. The, the Torah is very clear that the things that will happen to you, I remember as a little boy, as I had most kids, you know, you, you, you um, experiment with things. So I'll never forget this. There was a lamp in the living room that had a bulb in it. It was very thin, and you pushed a switch. It went, oh, took a switch, it went out. Incandescent. So I unscrewed the incandescent bulb. <laughs> I think you know where this story is going. And I stuck my finger inside. And boy, did I get a shot. <laughs> and that ended my career of sticking my fingers in, in electric sockets. And it was a very, very unpleasant. So that, that's what happens. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's all surgery. The children of Israel endure such challenges and vicissitudes to make us a greater people, a stronger people. You know, at the Seder table, Right before the meal is a remembrance of the Korban Chagiga, a different offering than the Passover sacrifice. We eat an egg. It's old tradition. We eat an egg. Why is this egg so important? Because remember, you have to eat something before you eat the what represents the, the Passover lamb because you have to eat the lamb on a full stomach, not like a, like a rich man, like a free person, not a poor person who's groveling over the food. Why an egg? Because an egg represents the Jewish people. It's a unique food. All foods, when you cook it, when you boil it, it becomes soft. You take a potato. It's hard. Right? You put it in water and you boil it and boil it. What happens? It becomes soft. You don't want to boil it too much because it cuts. You boil it too much, it all falls apart completely. But the egg has a different property. It's binding. And when you boil an egg, when you when you subject an egg to that which would tear apart any other food, the egg responds the other way. It becomes stronger. The people that we were the people we were on October 6 do not exist any longer we're a different nation we're different people and i don't just say it we there are many people around the world who are not jewish whose sensitivities. I can't tell you why exactly. I can tell you that Jews were very divided. I can't tell you that. I could tell you that we were protesting against each other on the streets, pulling down prayer separations and don't ask what was going on. It was not, it was not pretty. It wasn't the Civil War that the United States endured in the 19th century, but it was, it was not good. Ridiculous protests, each side cursed the other, and then, and then the sirens of October 7th came, 
In Jerusalem, it's unusual to have a rocket attack. That was different. And we're not the same people anymore. And never will be. Never will be. We have, we have issues, but not of that not of that magnitude. And the world was changed. People were changed. People were shocked. And that's what happens. It's a very real event. It's not something in the in the the world after we were traumatized. And you know, what's interesting is that many of the victims who lived in the Gaza envelope and lived in that area were not that religious necessarily. There were some, but there were many of them left-wing pieces. It, it didn't matter. It was if any part of the body was injured, the whole body was injured. I can't tell you why, but it's these events be ultimately cause a healing. As Ezekiel is told, eat the... Uh, eat the, this uh, scroll, and it, it became like honey in his mouth. Ultimately, it's a surgery that causes a tremendous healing. And it's not just a healing to us. It, it causes a healing to the world. People, the world has changed. People have, and it's sort of very polarizing because people just shot in one direction or the other. You know, but a lot of people were aroused that day. I'll tell you a crazy thing. This past um, Friday night, so I had dinner with a very, very well-known person who's very close to a lot of world leaders. That's all I'll say. I, he can get on the phone and talk to Biden, he's in there, talk to Bibi, to Netanyahu, to world leaders, he can, you know, he can, whatever it is, he's an extremely influential, powerful person who you know. And I, after dinner was done, so he and I had a, a chance to chat a little bit. And I asked him, you know, you know, before October 7th, the Israel's prime minister and America's president really were not getting along well at all. And he nodded. And they weren't even talking to each other. It was like, and then October 7th happened, which was the most, the greatest attack on our people since the Holocaust. And we're all processing it. No no one's figured. I mean, we're all in a straight up state of trauma completely, completely. And this is ongoing. Something like, I mean, Kristallnacht, 92 Jews were murdered. This was of an order of magnitude that's unknown in our lifetimes. So I, I said to him, you know, that, you know, Biden and, and Bibi weren't getting along. There was just a lot of stress between the United States and Israel at the time. And like, it's like, what, like, why did Biden, now, please, I ask one favor. Whoever you voted for or plan to vote for, if you hate this one, just set it all aside for a moment, Okay. Just forget all the crazy. Just, I just asked them a question like, when October 7th hit and the magnitude of what happened wasn't even realized. I remember when Shabbos Sabbath was over, we, no, we didn't even know, understand the magnitude of what had happened. It was only, it took a few days for, to understand what was even happening, the order, the size. And Biden did something that was unbelievable, and that is he flew to Israel, he hugged the Israeli prime minister, he immediately called for uh, shipments of arms to Israel. Like, why, I asked him, why Why did Biden, like, why did he come through for Israel like that? He didn't have to. He really didn't have to. Like, why? why did he do it? And he said to me, 
He said he's had this conversation with the president a number of times. And one of the things that the president has always said to him that his dad inspired him. His dad saw World War II, saw the destruction of European Jewry. And his dad was someone who was deeply influential on him. And the trauma of he was born during World War II. But the trauma of it all and the magnitude of what happened, he said, never again. And therefore, it's like something just arose in him that he had, he could not, he could not let that happen again. He could not let that again. So when I, when I, and it triggered in him such a reaction that never again, whatever problems he had, whatever he thought politically, whatever, he immediately, his father's words, Joe Sr., his father's words came to him and that he knew that he had to act at this critical juncture in history. So Jewish suffering is very traumatic for non-Jews, as it turns out, something I come to understand later in life. Many, many people not Jewish who told me that, you know, I, you know, when I even, you know, seeing films about the Holocaust, seeing Jewish suffering just triggered in me something very powerful. So as it turns out, the remember what I said to you at the very outset that when, when we do something, so there's most often when we make a decision, there are benefits, but there's a downside, but the benefits outweigh the downside. But when Hashem does something, it benefits everything on all sides. We don't understand all of it, but we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when someone dies, so the person who makes shrouds, he earns a living too. The grave digger, every, everything is affected by it. So as it turns out, that Jewish suffering is very traumatic to people. And during times of trauma, it causes people to act in a very polarized fashion. And, and we're watching this now, right? We're, we're all in on this now. We're observing the spectacle now where the world is so polarized in two different directions, in their feelings about the children of Israel, in their feelings about the Jewish people. Very polar. I mean, people who were suddenly are coming out here, are cutting out here, we're going, what's going on? Like it's, and it has, Jewish suffering has this remarkable impact on the soul of the non-Jew. And it causes non-Jews to repent. It causes non-Jew, Jewish suffering. I remember, never forget this. Years ago, a Christian once said to me, he said, the reason I believe in God is because anti-Semitism is so irrational, it has to be supernatural, and it can only be explained spiritually. I thought that was so powerful. So Jewish suffering also can, if the non-Jew's heart is open, if the non-Jew's heart is made from flesh, not from stone, so it can cause a non-Jew to do tshuva, to repent. That's what's really going on, my holy sister, in Isaiah 53. Remember, the first eight passages of Isaiah 53 is a soliloquy which will be uttered by the nations of the world when the Mashiach comes. And the nations admit that by his stripes we were healed. The nations express two things. Number one, the Jewish people suffered as a result of our iniquity, mi pesha ami nega lomo, but also Jewish suffering causes them to do tshuva. In verse 9 through verse 12, the Almighty, blessed be his holy name, resumes speaking from 9 through 12. It's really so beautiful, so yummy. So in that, one other thing that should be said, the it's not an. I, I don't think it sh could be or should be ignored. There is an elephant in the room. Those who the Jews are have stress with, who are not Jewish, are generally those who are of the Abrahamic religion. I mean, you could ignore this, but you would be living, you know, with blinders on. So it, it's a, it's axiomatic 
that Jews just don't have a deal with Hindus and Buddhists and we just we just don't we don't have a history of persecution from you know Zen whatever we just don't obviously religions that are Abrahamic and more specifically that believe that the Jews were chosen all Abrahamic religions believe that the Jews were chosen let's you know let's just we're all adults they they both we're not on an even playing field. That means all of the Abrahamic religions believe that the Jews were chosen. The land of Israel was given to the people of Israel. All that stuff. They all believe that. And then at some point, the Jewish people did not adopt the religion of of those uh, peoples who were Abrahamic, but then at times rejected that chosenness. Oh, that does that is a source of tension. It's very obvious that Jews don't don't <laughs> we're not we're not in a fight with the Eskimos. I mean so I mean that has to be taken into account as well. And ultimately we are exiled to nations where we can have a very big impact, and the nations of the world benefit from that. And you should know that when the nations of the world expel the Jews from their lands. So, of course, we blame ourselves, you know, when England expelled its Jews, when Portugal expelled its Jews, Spain, all of them. In, in the Jewish view, so, of course, what did, what did we do wrong? Very self, we're introspective and we're self-critical. Tanakh teaches us to live that way. But you should know that when Spain expelled its Jews in the end of the 15th century, and Portugal subsequently did the same a handful of years later, at the very end of the 15th century, God was giving up on Spain. In a sense, God was giving up on Portugal. It means you don't deserve to have Jews in your midst to give you the light. The nations of the world have to take that into account. When the Jews were expelled from all, all sorts of nations, it's Hashem saying that, okay, I'm taking the Jews away from you. You understand? You, and it's Hashem, in a sense, giving up on them. Do we all hope, the Jews hope, that the nations repent? Of course we do. But the Jews are a polarizing people. But always remember this. The Jew who fears Hashem understands the eternal oracles of Yechezkel. Take that parchment, which contains the lamentations of the people of Israel, of the children of Israel, and it's written on both sides. Eat it. Swallow it. It'll taste like honey. It'll be sweet. It looks like lamentations, but it's all to make us all a better world, a better place. And please, God, we will witness the coming of the true Messiah quickly in our time. Thank you. Amen. You know, I think for all of that, the hardest part is whenever Christians will just simply say that they're suffering so much, even the wars now, because they reject Jesus. And that, that's just so... I want to comment on that. I have to comment on this. This is mind-blowing. I must, I know you have 15 people on hold. Just give me a second on this. This is really chutzpah. The English language is bloated. It's a huge language, but there is not a word in the English language I'm aware of that equals the, the word chutzpah in Hebrew, gall, whatever. It's a big chutzpah on, that the Christians should do this. The Jews suffer so much because we rejected Jesus, and therefore this is our deserving punishment. All the church fathers, without exception, stated this. It's not an outlier. They all stated this. Every one of them. They all, they all hated us, and they all said the same thing, and the reformers all said the same thing. But here's the audacity that they have. These uh, Christian leaders all say as you, that, in fact, all the followers of Jesus and Jesus' mother all of them were, were, were killed. All of them were killed, with the exception of John, because they need John 
the son of Zebedee to stick around so he can write the book of John because Christians were always well aware that the book of John was written last. So John had to live in the 90s, so he, he lived really a very long time. So the Christians say, ah, look at this. Look at all the followers of Christ. They all killed for their faith. <laughs> so it's such a, it's such a, a, really a head game. I hope Christians will even just take this to heart. So when Jews suffer and are killed, that shows how wicked and evil the Jews are, and that they were Christ kills and they rejected the Lord. But somehow when Christians suffer and die, oh, that proves the rightfulness and the truthfulness of Christianity and the saintliness of the martyrs. It's mind-blowing. It's such a, 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 a scale of unequal weights and measurements that is employed. And Look, I'm not patronizing Christians. Christians know that. But you guys are thinking, people. Use your head. How do you, on one hand, say, oh, I mean, couldn't I say? I wouldn't say it. But if I wanted to, I could say, why is it that all the disciples of Jesus, they were all killed, and Paul was executed, and Peter was killed? By the way, almost none of this is found in the Christian Bible. Peter, uh, Paul's death, that's later legend. But let's say I concede it all. So imagine if I would say to a Christian, why did God make sure that all the disciples were all executed? I mean, Stephen is executed, yeah. Um, a, a John, the son of Zebedee, uh, lives, but his brother doesn't make it. Ah, uh, it shows that Christianity is a false religion. I think, I think, and I just want to talk to the Christian one, I think you would be appalled if I said that to you, really. If I said to you, you fools, all the disciples were all killed, doesn't that show you, and your Lord Day was killed, doesn't that show you that they were following the wrong religion? I think you would be flabbergasted if I said that to you. You would find that so appalling, so insulting, so infuriating. Don't tell me it's not true. You would. So if you know it's appalling, then why say it to the Jews? It's so silly. I was thank you for your question. If you enjoyed this program, please like and subscribe. <laughs> יציר נברא לעת נעשה בחף צוקו אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נועד